and welcome back to Teens on Topic. I'm your host, Cedric Hughes, and today we'll be talking about the COVID-19 epidemic. So first, to get us started off, um, we wanted to bring into discussion what this epidemic is like for us as teenagers of Davis and um, having our expertise and our viewpoint for you know teenagers around America and around the world. So with that, just you know, putting the question out there, what have your guys' experiences been so far with this pandemic? Um, I would say so far, luckily, my family's really lucky with dealing with this pandemic in the sense that um, they have not lost um, their jobs. We're able to successfully go to the grocery store and get any supplies we need. We're not hoarders, I can promise that. But it's, um, first things first, my family, I definitely know is like very lucky but of course we've all lost things during this pandemic um my my cousin was actually affected um tested positive for COVID-19 luckily he has um recovered successfully but I also have an uncle who's in working as a doctor currently so um it's been pretty stressful um uh, yeah it's been pretty stressful and we're all seniors here so we've all had that affected but um other than that we've been pulling through pretty okay yeah. Yeah. Ben, what do you think? I think what's interesting, like from a kid's point of view, is that by and large, it's not like a serious health risk to most kids, like barring some kind of like, like other health problems. So it's mostly just an issue of like how it affects our families health wise and, and then kind of what those impacts are, are like, you know, things like prom being canceled or graduation being canceled or, or like there's, issues that to us like seem like big deals but then you just step back for a minute and think about it. it's like wait there are people who are like have lost everything and we've we've lost a few months of of like high school stuff i mean it, it's really like it's it's bad but i think we should all also be grateful that to us it's really not as big of a deal as it, it is to a lot of people worldwide so like i definitely think it it has affected us but we're fortunate that it hasn't by and large, affected kids in a way where we see lots of kids dying. So I'm, I'm uh, very much grateful for that. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Zara, what do you think? I, I agree with Ben because I notice like sometimes my friends are like, we should just, you know, break the law and we should just hang out. But I always see that as a concern, like, because I don't have my grandparents living in the United States, so I don't really have interaction with them. But I have friends who have, you know, grandparents with chronic um, health problems. And I see it as kind of like, you know, I don't want to harm my friend's family because my mother works, you know, in the hospital and she's still at work. And so it's kind of, you know, you don't know what's coming into the house. We don't know how things, you know, how it will affect other families. And so I see it as, you know, sure, my senior stuff is kind of canceled. My you know, college, first year of college will probably be, you know, fall will be online. But I think that's just, you know, something we're able to deal with. And there's, you know, you know, worse things out there for other people. And so it's kind of, I look at it as, as, as another perspective, and I just see it as just actually kind of a minor thing. So for sure. Adam, what's your perspective on this? I think it really just puts everything in our lives in perspective. Like, like Ben and Zara said, like there's all these things that people are losing and it really just like makes me want to not take those things for granted because there's things like school prom that I'm missing out on that I kind of expected to have. Those were like certains in my life, things that I was looking forward to. But now that they're gone, it's like, you know, you really need to like reflect on what you have before you lose it. And I think that's what this whole situation has taught me personally. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And, well, and kind of building off of what Adam said, what I think is interesting is that we're seeing and kind of realizing that a lot of things which we took for granted as being like necessary institutions are actually really social constructs, like <laughs> things like going to school five days a week. Like it hadn't really occurred to me, like if something more important comes up, we can just not do that. We can have online school. And it, it's really the things that we think are like these necessary aspects of life really aren't even necessary when there's something like more important like a like a pandemic that actually affects people's health and could potentially be fatal when there are more important things and things that we view as as being like the most important parts of, of our life take a back seat and i think that's kind of a cool thing to remember and just 
use that to keep this all in perspective. For sure. Well, you guys all have very, very positive and, and very self-aware views on this. It's, it's very nice. Um, you know, I, I saw a quote recently. It said that we're all in the same storm, but we don't all necessarily have the same boat. You know, so there are those of us in society and, you know, Zoe and Ben, you guys both talked about this, who are very fortunate um, in that we aren't losing that much. You know, it, it sucks that we don't have prom, right? Um, and, you know, it sucks that we aren't getting to, to finish out our senior year. But we also, you know, um, are fortunate enough to ourselves not be so impacted um, by the virus. And um, from what I've heard from many students in Davis is that, um, like what Zoe said, some of us do have um, friends and family who are affected by the virus, but by and large, there aren't that many people who are losing family members um, to this. But that's not the case for everyone. You know, we see um, 16 million Americans who have filed for unemployment to date now. So, you know, across the country, people are losing not only their jobs, but their lives too. You know, the death toll continues to climb every day. So, you know, same storm of, you know, COVID-19 being this pandemic, but somewhat different boats there. So going off of that, you know, I saw the, uh, the Wall Street Journal, they posted an article recently that was talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the jobs market and moreover on the graduating class of 2024, uh, sorry, of 2020 um, for college students. And so these students were supposed to be entering the hottest job market in 50 years. And all of that is now completely gone. You know, uh, job um, opportunities have all dried up, internships have been pulled, um, and these kids who were majors in, um, you know, biochemistry, engineering, aerospace, they've all been told by their college counselors to not hold out for, you know, their dream job or the job that they've been training for for so long and that they should just take what they can now. So what do you guys think about that situation and the, and the students who are in that position of having to enter this recession style job market? And what do you guys think of our futures? Do you think that it will impact us um, to the point of maybe looking for jobs this summer or even into college? Who? Wait, which person oh, would you call? Anyone okay. can talk. Oh, Ben, go ahead. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, this obviously isn't the first time we've seen something like this, right? Like there was like the 2008 recession, then further back, of course, you have a, like the Great Depression. And there are just lots of time periods where obviously it's been harder to find a job. So in that sense, it's, it's not something that's unprecedented. And I think my guess, uh, as a person who knows basically nothing of, about economics, I would think probably that it'll be like a somewhat temporary thing, right? Like for now, somebody who studied engineering might end up having like a non-engineering job. But then once this, uh, like once the economy kind of recovers to a large extent, which it probably will at some point, you would think, then at, at that point, I would uh, speculate that it would be possible for those people to kind of move back towards getting jobs they had trained for or, or dreamed of having. So it's probably mostly a temporary issue. Um, the whole economic like crisis here, it's not caused by like some underlying economic factor, right? It, it's just caused by a disease outbreak that's made people need to stop working. So in that sense, once the disease outbreak goes away, I think you, my guess would be that it would be reasonable to expect a quicker economic recovery than you would see if it were, if the economic crisis were caused by some really deep underlying economic problem that had to be worked out. Once the disease is gone, it'll probably, the uh, economic impacts of, of that will probably be gone at, at some point too, uh, making this a pretty temporary thing. Sure. Um, Adam, do you have anything to add on? Yeah, just going off of that, I think the, the hardest part about this in regards to the economy is there's no timeline. It's a virus, you know. Uh, a vaccine could be one, two years out, and there's no like certainty of it being cured then. So there's no guarantee that people can go back to work in the you know, upcoming future. And this has affected me personally, too. Like I, My parents were considering a gap year for me, but just like going off of that, there's what would I do? Like, I can't work, I can't travel. So it's just like, everything is at like a just frozen, like nothing is going like the economy has stopped. 
it's just hard because employers don't know when they can start hiring people again. For sure. Yeah. Zoe? Um, I feel like, yeah, um, I totally agree with Adam in the sense that this is so unpredictable. I've heard several different, like, I've heard several different months and several, several different values of time as to where this is going to end, but no one really, really knows. Um, like people suspect, um, people suspect another six months of um, nothing will ever be normal again. Um, people have said by the end of May. Um, others have said that we won't, or we'll start college. If we're going to college, we'll start that online, even if we intended to, um, even if um, we intended to go out of state for that. So I, um, in terms of jobs, I'm really nervous because I was intending to get a um, job during the summer, but now that doesn't look like it's going to happen. But um, I, um, honestly, I really don't know what's going to happen. I'm, it's really unpredictable. And I don't think anyone knows, none of the politicians, um, none of um, the scientists have been the most consistent, yet the politicians don't really seem to be listening to them on this, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, Zara, what's your take? Um, well, I mean, I see like people saying, you know, like, oh, we'll expect, you know, summer, we may be able to get out, but then they're expecting a second wave also, mm -hmm. just based on how things have been happening in China and they're just taking it on our side because they're kind of like a few months ahead. So I, I mean, I'm also seeing people are kind of noticing how much, you know, with taking on to like a global warming perspective that people are saying, oh, look at our environment now. LA has like, you know, it's like smog has decreased because everyone's working online or people have lost their jobs. But like, I kind of see that as, you know, part of me thinks that somehow we have been put on hold and people are realizing that some jobs that can be done online should be done online. And that when this is kind of over those things that need to be in person, like if you're a hairdresser, if you, you know, I don't know, like a lot of jobs that have to be kind of done in person, but are yet canceled and like told to be closed can resume. But I, I don't know, it's kind of confusing because everyone's pushing back the date further and further. And so we don't know when, you know, someone's going to come out of a vaccine. And plus these things, can every year, like, if it's going to be like the flu, it's going to change every year. It's not the same vaccine won't work always. So it's kind yeah. Of yeah, yeah, definitely. I think these are all really, really great takes on the matter. And Adam, you had talked about considering a gap year um, for going into college next year. And, and I think that's really interesting because I was doing, you know, just the exact same thing. Um, the college that I'm planning on attending um, next fall, just today put out a notice that they think that classes for the fall quarter um, might be online. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time too thinking about would a gap year be best, but then also, you know, exactly like you mentioned, what are you going to be doing during that time? So uh, Ben, Zoe, and Zara, have you guys given any thought to uh, schooling in the fall of 2020 and, you know, college um, decisions and, and what you're going to be doing for that? Yeah, I mean, part of the issue is we don't know what'll happen. I don't think anybody knows what'll happen. I think anybody who tells you that they know exactly what's gonna happen is probably lying to you. So it's really tough to make plans when you have no idea what you're planning for. So sure. I, I mean, I've kind of thought of, about it like hypothetically, like, oh, maybe if school ends up being online in, in the fall, I might do a gap year. I might, yeah, do something else. But then it's really tough to actually like start making concrete definitive plans for doing that when there's just as high of a chance that that classes won't be online. So yeah, it, it's just tough to prepare when you don't know what you're preparing for. Sure. Yeah, I, I already committed to a college and I'm also taking a summer course um, through, um, let, that will be online. And so I kind of been, I feel like I, I was, you know, thinking that if it's gonna be online, I should just still take it because I'll anyways still kind of be on the track to graduating you know, at the time, you know, 2024. So I kind of, it. I think honestly for me that it's, I think I would rather do it online in my opinion. I know it would be different kind of environment. I won't be meeting new people. I won't be able to kind of have those same ways that you would be having office hours with your professor. And so I think I haven't actually even considered, you know, thinking about a gap year. I just, 
And it what the problem was also for me picking to decide to commit to a college because the college I committed to actually hadn't even visited because I was expecting the visit in spring when I heard back from all of, for spring break, when I heard back from all of them, I'd go out on a road trip and see them. And my top college, which I got accepted to, didn't even, I can't even go, I didn't get to see them. So it's kind of even hard because I was like, do I even feel like I can be on this campus? So mm-hmm. it'll be also a jump to even if, you know, freshman second semester to jump in on campus will be kind of weird because you already know your professors yet in a different way. For sure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. Zoe, what do you think? Well, it's like for, for 12 years, we've been told what's going to happen to us. Like we've been told what comes after this. Um, and then we've also been kind of, we've kind of had it branded into our minds that like, um, here's college, um, treat it as a necessity, priced as a luxury. Here's how you get there. And then um, it's you go to point A, point B, point C, point D, um, maybe point A, point five. But at the end of the day, it's like, I've always been um, pressed to going to college. Here's what you do. Then you leave home, then you go to college and you make friends. And after that, you get a job. Now that's, that's all been put to a halt. This fragile, like stoic system that we've had has been put to a halt. So um, I feel like I've not been, and we've kind of been told what to do for that. So it feels like for once in our life, even the administrators don't know what to tell us what to do. So that's, um, yeah, it's kind of, everyone just kind of rolling with the punches. No one's really in full control of the situation. I haven't really, um, sometimes I feel like I, I'm not able to afford to consider um, alternative options because I've never been told what if I, what if I don't want to, yeah, what if I don't want to go down the mainstream path now that, I, now that everything's been thrown into chaos. So, um, yeah. No, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think that's a really good point there about, you know, we have been told that this is what we're going to be doing for the past 12 years. Right. And, and now it's kind of all changed in a matter of just a couple of months. So, so yeah, and, and of course, given that none of us are infectious disease experts or, you know, virus experts um, or up there in the echelons of power uh, governors or the national politicians who are trying to figure this out, are you guys optimists or pessimists? When do you guys think the country might reopen? Uh, Zoe? <laughs> Um, I'm actually kind of leaning more towards optimism. I was, um, I had in mind, um, in March, I was like, oh, this will be done by mid-May. It's not going to be done by mid-May, but I still feel like um, during the summer, things are going to clear up. And I also think that, um, I also think that this is where it's finally like the last straw where we're calling out the horribleness of our healthcare system, uh, the fragility of our school system. Um, I'm not saying that this virus is a good thing, like not in the slightest. Um, it's just, um, it's just, it forces us to reflect on those systems that we've built up for so long that we've said that is the only way that things can happen, like with jobs, like uh, that's the only way you can do your job, going into office, uh, going into an office, nine to five, clock out. Maybe that's, maybe that's not all there is. And this, um, and this whole quarantine situation is really forcing that into the light. For sure. Yeah. Uh, ben, what do you think? I think it's really important to determine what we mean by like when this whole thing's over, because I feel like there's going to be a point at which there is still coronavirus spreading among the population at which people decide that we're no longer willing to quarantine ourselves because the costs of being locked down, the economic costs of, of having 20 million Americans not working are all of a sudden outweighing the health harms caused by coronavirus. Yeah, so and I, we saw that this weekend with yeah. the protests in Milwaukee, yeah. Right, yeah, so I really think that at some point people are just going to decide, like basically make a decision that we're going to, to start prioritizing the economy over people's health. And I mean, whether that's right or wrong, I think the question is not when will the coronavirus stop infecting people, but it's when are we going to think that that's no longer as bad as the economic harm is being caused by it? So I think that's really just like a value judgment that's 
probably going to end up being made by yeah people in in power or yeah politicians so it's really yeah whenever they decide to pull the, the trigger and say that one of those two things is no longer as bad as the other that's when this whole thing will end yeah zara what do you think I think that at some point this might become maybe like I'm I'm optimistic at some point we will you know the quarantine will have to be lifted but I think this might become kind of like a new normal like maybe this kind of reemerges every year just kind of like the flu and I think that at some point people will kind of have to realize that we can't just continue you know being holed up in your house all the time like you will have to go back to going, you know, to what we used to do before. So I'm optimistic that, you know, it, it'll be lifted, you know, whenever. I don't know when, but it, it will it will happen. Sure. Uh, Adam, what do you think? I think, like Ben said, it's really going to come down to a cost-benefit analysis that is going to have to be made by our society as a whole. Um, it's tough to predict anything substantial at this point, but I mean, I'm hopeful for the summer and, you know, having the opportunity to go to college in the fall and just continue life as normal. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and Ben and Adam, I think those are really excellent points that you guys make about the cost benefit analysis. And, you know, that in my mind, at least this doesn't end until we have a vaccine, you know, it's just, we do not live in a world where people are going to be comfortable going to a crowded movie theater or a stadium or a college where, you know, people are going to be standing or sitting shoulder to shoulder with people unless there's a vaccine. So until that point, which, you know, vaccines take uh, 12 to 18 months and sometimes with some diseases, we never get them. So, you know, it's going to be a long wait for that. And until then, we need to keep weighing that, you know, that cost benefit. Um, is it you know, worth reopening. And we've seen that in countries around the world, um, developing countries that don't necessarily have the luxury that um, America has of getting to choose to shut down. So we saw that in uh, Mexico and we saw that in Brazil. Um, for, for instance, the Brazilian president released a statement saying that people die of, you know, people have to die, right? And it it has to come at some point, so it might as well because um, be because of coronavirus. And you know, as as kind of boorish and unfeeling as that might seem, um, you know, when you look at the situations for countries around the world um, and what could very well become the situation in America, the life cost of not reopening actually dwarfs the cost of the virus itself. You know, there becomes a point where in the quarantines and in the shutdowns, we can't keep food on the shelves, right? Where society isn't functioning to a level where people are losing their lives, not because of the virus, but because of the breakdown of society. And so that's why countries like Brazil and Mexico have chosen to keep open. But on the other hand, we see um, countries like Korea, China, um, territories like Hong Kong, where they reopen and they see spikes in cases. So I think from that, you know, my take on, on the whole thing uh, would be to reopen at any point before we have a vaccine would be to see a spike in cases and um, with that, a spike in deaths. But um, Ben and Adam, like you guys said, it's gonna come down to you know what we as a society value. So you like the protesters in Milwaukee over the past couple of days who have kind of made the call that we have to reopen and it's worth the lives, uh, lives lost versus um, you know the opinions on the other side of the aisle. So until that day, you know, <laughs> happy quarantine everyone. And I, I hope you guys have been been finding uh, good activities to fill your guys' days. And before we sign off here, is there anything else that anyone wants to bring up, talk about, uh, put on the table for discussion? I think one last thing is like, I don't think it's up to the, the individual to make that call at like at, at what point should we stop quarantining? Like if, if we have some people saying, yes, let's keep quarantining. And some people saying, no, I'm sick of this. I'm going to walk out outside now. Like the problem is, is that then you, you have the economic harms of half of society not working and you still have people being sick. So I, I would say that until our society collectively reaches a point where we're comfortable saying, let's end this quarantine, then even if people personally feel like we shouldn't be doing it, then I think they should still be complying with it and still be understanding that this is a collective decision we have to make, not an individual choice. Sure. 
Yeah. Does anyone else want to add anything? Well, to end on a light note, um, how have you guys been uh, spending your quarantine, filling the days? Zara? Uh, well, I've been kind of just doing arts and crafts. I mean, I've been doing a lot of also video games, found some new video games to play because I finally found the time. I didn't have to write essays over the weekend, so now kind of had free time. So yeah. that's kind of what I've been doing. Very nice. Zoe? Um, I've been trying to, yeah, I've been doing a lot of art as well. And then, um, like, going through CD cabinets, like, places in the house where I can, like, relive uh, feelings of nostalgia. Um, I went through, like, all my Barbie movies, um, uh, Miyazaki films, um, and my next stop is Star Wars. So I'm just kind of um, going through, like, every part of the house where I was intending to say goodbye in September, but that might be a little longer. But, yeah. Adam? Uh, recently me and my mom planted a small garden, so we got some like ha habaneros, tomatoes, and now cucumbers for my grandma. Uh, we're working on that, and then I've also just been trying to exercise as much as I can, keep my mental health strong. Nice. Ben? I've just been reading, hanging out with the family. Yeah, just taking the time to like enjoy the things that we don't usually have time to do, like, like just lying outside enjoying the warm sun it's like when i have like 10 comp lit essays i have to worry about that's not something that i have time to do so just taking the time to enjoy those smaller things in life very nice yeah yeah i've been uh, been spending a lot of time with um with the family uh going on really long walks and and i've been trying to trying to cook something something fun every day so so yeah yeah that's that's been that's been my quarantine well thank you ben zara zoe and adam for joining us here today and thank you everyone who's tuning in and I hope you've enjoyed our social distancing version of Teens on Topic. I've been your host, Cedric Hughes, and we'll see you next time.